Hello everyone, my name is Arjun. Uh, you'll be seeing similar themes in my talk. I'll be talking about uh, tough bulligan and double bulligan architected concrete, and that's enabled by two component additive manufacturing. Uh, so I'll begin uh, just describing what our bio inspiration is, the bulligan and double bulligan architecture, which has already been touched on now, uh, so you're familiar. And I'll be talking about why we're leveraging that to create tougher concrete uh, in terms of fracture and in terms of strength and how that's enabled by a robotic system. And this is incentivized by the increase in how we're seeing 3D printing adopted across the world now, and also the need for more resilient and efficient structures. So yeah, you did see this just a moment ago, but this is the blue again architecture found in the mantis shrimp. And uh, I'll highlight again that we're seeing these uh, chitin fibrils that are oriented in a helical fashion, uh, defined by this uh, relative rotation of pitch angle gamma. And the, if you imagine this organism is hitting something, these damages are going to occur where the fracture occurs uh, between the chitin fibrils that are joined by a weak protein matrix. And so then the formation of that crack is going to deflect along the orientation of those fibrils in a twisted manner. So the similar uh, organism is the coelacanth fish. And so when we look at the fish scale, we can see the double bulligan architecture, which is very similar. It's collagen fibrils joined by a protein in matrix. But instead, every layer is coupled with a, a perpendicular layer. So this forms a bilayer unit that is then rotated helically. And again, we can uh, see how the fracture might occur. But in all cases, this leads to toughening mechanisms that are very desirable in these organisms for survival and also for our concrete. Our, our goal with the, all of these architectures is to develop an architecture, architecture material. So architecture itself is referring to the arrangement of different phases or different materials within the, the bulk comp composite, and that's different than the microstructure. But this arises from the processing methods of the fabrication or how the organism grows. And all of this has to do with the overall properties and the performance that we see in the material itself. So if we were to see a conventional sort of monolithic brittle material, say glass or stone, you have this brittle response. But what we're targeting in architectures and architectural materials is to have multiple uh, performance characteristics. So for instance, having strength, but as well as toughness. And that's the goal of this research. For our research, we used a two component additive manufacturing platform shown here schematically, where we have a six axis robot arm and we're printing on a 5.7 meter long track. We're continuously feeding our print head with uh, concrete and accelerant. And then at the print head, we have an additional mixing chamber that's gonna mix the material right before the nozzle. This allows for a high degree of control over our material quality. And then throughout this system, we have pressure sensors, temperature sensors, and this is necessary to maintain consistency throughout the print. If you're printing for you know, hours, you need to have a, an ability to see what's happening as your temperature evolves or pressure evolves in the material. Uh, to have the robot actually move, you need to define where it's going. And so this is to do with the tool pathing. And again, this was touched on a moment ago. We're using an algorithm that was developed in Rhino Grasshopper, which takes certain input parameters, so the filament size, uh, the dimensions, and then we're converting some sort of base architected unit to an infill that will be followed in a final polyline, for instance, uh, for a constraining geometry, which is for us a beam. And that is then converted into uh, a code of XYZ coordinates that the robot will follow. For our, all of our tests, we created these beams. Uh, they're about this big. And uh, they're for the bulligan architecture and the double bulligan architecture at a pitch angle, so relative rotation of 10 degrees. This is on, based on previous tests that we had done. Uh, and then we have the perpendicular lamellar and the parallel lamellar architecture, which are kind of like conventionally printed shapes, what you would see if you like opened up a simplified uh, 3D slicer. And this is defined relative to the length of the beam, uh, so perpendicular going perpendicular to the length and parallel parallel to the length, and then a cast reference case. We're going to be measuring based on ASTM standards. So for the modulus of rupture, we're measuring uh, that with the ASTM C239M. And then for fracture, tough, fracture toughness, we're measuring again with ASTM, this time E1820. And we're measuring both the uh, KIC and then also the KJC based on this relationship of the J integrals. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to measure the work of fracture. And this is just the area under the curve divided by the nominal fracture area. And we tested at seven days uh, all of our samples at a loading rate of 0 0.5 millimeters per minute. So beginning with the modulus of rupture results, you can see on the left, these are the low displacement plots for some of our tests. And then a summary of the results with the, the error bars 
And what we're seeing, with the exception of the perpendicular lamellar case, so the blue case, uh, all of the results for the modulus of rupture are statistically the same. And that ultimately means that we're not compromising on the overall strength uh, of the material by introducing these architectures. Uh, and in the low displacement, you can start to see that there's not a brittle failure to our blue again samples. There's a slight tapering off at the load. When we move on to our fracture tests, and these are done on notched bend specimens, what we're seeing is that we can uh, have immediately, you can observe that there's a, a tapering at the end, a softening effect for both of the bio-inspired architectures. And this leads to an increase in the fracture toughness that we observed uh, up to a 73% increase in toughness for the bulligan samples and then 35% uh, for the double bulligan samples. Uh, and this is compared to what is a, a brittle failure for the lamellar, uh, parallel lamellar and the cast reference cases. And then for work of fracture, we're seeing about an 80% increase. And this is to do with the overall, uh, the area under the curve again. So it's fairly evident, but this led to a lot of questions uh, about why this is happening in our, in our samples. So when we looked at uh, the resistance curve, which is basically taking our, our low displacement plots and reformulating them as a, a function of crack extension and uh, toughness. What we're seeing for, at least beginning with the parallel lamellar architecture and the cast reference specimen, there's a, a flat line, which means that our initial fracture toughness is our final fracture toughness. We have no toughening. And you can also see that in the fractured samples where it's, it's a flat surface and it is very much what you would imagine if you broke a piece of unreinforced concrete and you had a needed tensile failure. In comparison, we have the resistance curves for our, our, our bio-inspired architectures. And you can see that in the double blue again, in the blue again, the orange line, there's a, a steady rise in toughness as a crack extends. And then for the double blue again sample, you can see an initial rise and then a, another steady rise about halfway through the sample. And you can observe that sort of qualitatively in the fractured surfaces, which are much more twisted and tortuous. And this is in contrast to, again, the flat surfaces that were in the cast and lamellar reference cases. So we have a lot of hypotheses about why this is happening, because it's very interesting for us to see these very different forms of fracture. Uh, and for the Bulligan sample, we are studying uh, well, what we're observing and what we're hypothesizing from the steady rise uh, is that there is a twist forming, and this twist causes an interlocking of the two fractured planes. The twist itself I'll talk a little bit more about later. But then again, in the double blue again sample, we're seeing this initial rise, which we hypothesize is due to the, the bilayer, the perpendicular bilayer in the first few layers. And then again, this uh, very tortuous surface that is generating interlocking and, and potentially cracking. And all of that again, in contrast to the flat R curves of the, the reference cases. So to, to further understand why we're getting any of this crack twisting, we look back at the the microstructure of our material, and we observe that, and this is at 0.4x magnification in micro CT, that there are these uh, processing induced uh, voids or channels that go through our sample, and they occur at the interface uh, between two filaments. And so we're seeing that what would otherwise maybe be seen as a, a weak interface is what is encouraging these types of crack mechanisms uh, in our concrete uh, that are ultimately increasing our, our fracture performance. And again, we can look at it from the perspective of how are these uh, crack twisting effects in terms of maybe linear elastic fracture mechanics improving the, the fracture performance? And that's because we're transitioning by, by virtue of crack deflection from a mode one tensile failure to some sort of mixed mode failure that involves shear failure. And that in and of itself is of a higher energy. Uh, it requires a greater amount of energy to fracture in shear than in tension. And that is what we hypothesize is happening in these samples. So just to conclude, our bio-inspired architectures were increasing the fracture toughness beyond that of a you know, conventionally cast or lamellar printed sample. And that is done without compromising the strength, so in the modulus of rupture tests. The materials did not have a brittle failure, so you observe that there was a softening effect at the end of the sample. And so it's very different than the effect that you would see in conventionally, uh, again, in conventional cast concrete. And we hypothesize that this is to do with some sort of mixed mode failure that is happening as a crack propagates through our sample. And, uh, and that is underlying one of the mechanisms for increasing the fracture toughness. And uh, yeah, uh, sort of as like a, taking a step back, what we hope from all of this work is that we're beginning a new step towards where our material sort of by design of the architecture is improving the fracture toughness and leading towards uh, a concrete that you could have a reliable tensile strike because it has a measurable fracture toughness to it uh, for reinforced and unreinforced concrete.
Uh, and with that, I'll acknowledge NSF support through the Advanced Manufacturing Program and uh, pause for questions. Thank you. Thank you.